Hello everybody, my name is Colin Birkenbiel. I'm working at Fraunhofer Sky and today I'm going to present to you a project that I've done together with a master student in our team called Yasemin Sanimi. The title of my talk is Comparison of Alzheimer's Disease Progression Patterns Across Multiple Cold Study Datasets. So as you're all aware of, and as we've already talked about multiple times during the course of our session here, is we need some kind of basis to train our progression models on. And also, most often this is some sort of patient level data set originating, for example, from an observational cohort study. So we have a certain group of participants. We take the same measurements repeatedly over a period of time. We use these data sets, then feed them into our untrained models, train the models and estimate some sort of progression patterns that we in the end extracted from the data using our modeling approach. However, to show that these extracted progression patterns are actually robust um, and also reproducible, we need to show that they generalize beyond the training data itself by validating them in external independent data sets. And by independent data sets here, I mean data sets that on the one hand side have not been seen by the model during training, and on the other hand are in the best case originating from a completely different cohort study in the first place. So choosing these discovery and validation cores is actually no trivial task because all of the studies employ different assumptions and criteria for selecting participants. And these are so-called ex inclusion exclusion criteria and they inherently introduce a certain bias into the data. So for example, if we have one gr group of participants, so one cohort, where we deliberately recruited participants which are APOE4 positive, so APOE4 being a major genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, and we compare them to participants from another study where APOE4 positive participants have been excluded, this could already show us that we see two completely different progression profiles in theory, simply because the composition of the cohorts are different. And this also further translates to demographic factors. So if we say one cohort is significantly older than the other, all of these influences in, of the covariates could also translate further into the progression patterns that we see. And actually in previous work that we did, we could show that there is indeed a pretty significant influence of the differences between cores onto validation performance of machine learning models. So if we further s try to investigate that issue, one question that arises is if we train this the same approach on different cohort study data sets, do we actually see similar progression patterns or are they all over the place and are not comparable at all? So this is something that needed some investigation and on the other hand, the question was if we could come up with a certain way to score cohort similarities. So saying that two cohorts are more close to each other in their expressed patterns compared to other cohorts and then come up with a certain metric that we can quantify these similarities. The methodology we choose to um, investigate these two questions is as following. So we take different data sets coming from different co um, cohort studies. We take the same modeling approach, employ it to all of the different data sets, and then extract the same progression patterns and compare them and see if they're actually similar or if they deviate from each other significantly. Mm -hmm. And the modeling or data mining approach that we use here is our so-called multi-state models. And actually, for those of you who have listened to um, Michaela van der keynote yesterday, she already talked about these models briefly. So what we have here are basically state and transition models where we have certain disease stages as our states, so cognitively healthy or controls. We have the mild cognitive impaired state, which is basically um, the prodromal stage of Alzheimer's disease, and we have Alzheimer's disease here as a terminal end state. And then we have state transitions, which represent conversions between different diagnosis stages. And the self loop here basically says that a patient stays in the state, same state as in the time step before. Um, AD being a terminal state means we do not have any transitions back from there. So once you have 
an AD diagnosis, there's no way back. Um, and we train these models based on maximum likelihood training on the transitions that we actually see in the data sets that we investigate. And I'm going to talk more about them in the next slide. So what we can do now too to include more patient level data into the fitting of these models is we introduce covariates and model each of these transitions as a Cox regression, um, as you can see down here. And the covariates that we include are on the one hand demographic variables like age, biological sex, the years of the education of participants, the APOE4 status as a genetic risk factor, and mini, the mini mental state examination, or also called MMSE, which is a cognitive score. Um, then the patterns that we can mine from our data sets are on the one hand side the covariate hazard ratios, which may, means the influence of our covariates onto the risk of transitioning between stages the sojour times, so the expected time a certain participant spends in a state before transitioning to the next state, as well as the normal transition and conversion probabilities. So just the probability of if you're at a certain time point T in a certain state, how probable is it to convert to another state in the next time point T plus one. So Choosing the data set again was quite difficult because we have some prerequisites that need to be fulfilled by the data. So on the one hand side, we need longitudinal follow up because only on transitions we can fit our multi state models here. So this is one thing. On the other hand, we need all of the cores to share the same covariates and have no missing data in them, um, which again proves to be difficult because the more cohorts you want to include, the less overlap you see across all of these cores in terms of measured variables. So this limits us a little bit to which variables we could use as covariates here. However, we could come up with six different cohorts um, which we could use for our modeling approach. And these are the ETNI, the IBL, the Edneuromat, the Japanese ETNI, NACC, and ROSMAP cohorts. Um, and the participants, number of participants spans a quite very uh, variety from 500 participants up to 14,000. And this again further propagates into the number of transitions that we can use to fit our models from roughly 1500 up to 50,000 for NACC as the largest cohort. Um, so and this again, of course, translate in a little bit into the certainty with which we can make estimates on these data sets. And here you can already see the first um, result we got. So the, the hazard ratios for the covariates in this figure, we depict them from control uh, transitioning from control to MCI. And as I already said, the data that we use for fitting can have quite a significant influence on the certainty here. Um, so we are on a log scale on the y axis here, and we can see that for some cores, it's really hard for some covariates to make a definitive statement. Um, but for others, we see that the estimates are quite certain. And on the one hand side, we see things that are to be expected in Alzheimer's disease and that are consistent across the board, of course. So, for example, higher age has an increased uh, or increases the risk of transitioning further in the disease progress. Um, as well as worse cognitive performance also contributes to getting further in the, the disease stages, so going for MCI from the control state. Um, however, what we can also see is while the trend of this MCI here is consistent across cohorts, we can see that there are significant differences in the magnitude of this influence. For example, between NACC and ROSMAP here, you can see the confidence intervals are not overlapping and um, it seems that the influence is stronger in ROSMAP compared to NACC and again, stronger than ADNI here as well. And the same goes, for example, for the education where we can see that the influence is not only in terms of magnitude different, but also in terms of the, the orientation actually. For example, in ROSMAP, we see that education somehow, which is quite surprising, contributes to the risk of transitioning to MCI, while in ADNI it does not. Um, so we see the exact opposite. But in conclusion, we can say there are 
while the trends are most often the same, we still see differences in terms of magnitude. Looking at the next pattern, which is the sojour time, um, so the expected time that the participant spends in a certain state before transitioning to the next state, we again see that there are some calls where the confidence intervals are just so large that you can't say anything really. Um, but for some others, we see again significant differences. So for example, here again, NACC and ROSMAP as before, same with ADNI, um, and this becomes even more clear when we look into the MCI chart over there. So in terms of numbers, we can say that, for example, in the control state, we have basically three clusters. So the ADNI, NACC, um, uh, and sorry, uh, ADNI, NACC, and um, JADNI, which are roughly around the 16, 15 years um, sojour time. We have ROSMAP, who is really low with nine years, and then we have two others, which are really hard to estimate in this case. Um, and we see similar results in the MCI sojour time. So again, quite different estimates coming from all of the cohorts. Looking at the transition probabilities, you can see two plots here, one with the um, transition probabilities from the control state here on the left hand side and one for the MCI state on the right hand side. And the bars basically depict the probability of transitioning from the control state here to each other state. So dark blue meaning control to control, the intermediate blue here meaning control to MCI and light blue control to AD. And um, you can again see that the patterns vary quite a bit across all cohorts, while we still see some that are similar. So again, J ADNI, NACC and ADNI look kind of similar in terms of um, transition probabilities, probabilities for the control, while ROSMAP is significantly lower here in the probability of staying in control. And um, the opposite is visible for Eibel and Neuromat here. Um, and looking into the MCI transition probabilities, we can see that the differences are even yeah, more obvious to us. So the, the probabilities vary way more. And again, we can see that I should mention that these are transition probabilities over a five year period. And in this five year period already, we see quite substantial differences across the cohorts in terms of transition probabilities which again further translates into the, uh, so this is basically the survival probability. So in our case of AD diagnosis, this is the chance of not getting an AD diagnosis when staying on the left-hand side in the control state and on the right-hand side again in the MCI state. And you can see that our risk of not converting to AD is, also again significantly different or so let's say substantially different across the different um, studies here so you can see that j adni and nacc are, are pretty close while the others um, deviate quite strongly so here we can say that for example nacc and rosmap after five years are at 88 percent and eibel is still roughly at one percent um, and the difference is even larger again looking into the MCI state because here we can see a span from let's say 10 percent here for a neuromat up to um, again like 80 percent over there so again we see quite different patterns here so now the question still stays can we say though which cores are most like and can we quantify the similarity be between cores on some way and the way we try to do that um, is shown here in this figure so what we did we applied a kernel based average linkage clustering based on the pairwise log like nodes so we took our independent cohorts we estimated the likelihoods of those cohorts under a model trained on another cohort so in the end we get for this specific model or the likelihoods for all the model independent cohorts, which applying this to all pairwise combinations gives us all the likelihoods of all cohorts under all models. And this kernel matrix is then used as a similarity matrix and further on turned into a distance matrix, um, which we then use for a pairwise 
clustering of the log likelihoods of each cohort under each fitted model. So here you have the results of set clustering. On the x-axis you can see the cohort names and on the y-axis you have the log likelihood distance. And looking into the right hand lower corner, you can see that Adni and J Adni are in close proximity of each other. Adni, Romet and Ibel, then followed by NSCC are quite close. And then again, Rosmap is pretty much off the chart compared to the other cohorts. And what we found really interesting about this result is that it makes our experience when working with all of these data sets quite well. So, for example, looking at Adni and J Adni, it's not too surprising that they turn out to be quite close to each other because J Adni is the short form for Japanese Adni, which already hints at it being a sister study to the original Adni. And by sister study, um, I mean they use the same lab procedures for sample collections as well as the same recruitment criteria to enroll participants so that they are quite of comparable to each other is not, it's, I mean, it's by design. They are meant to be comparable to each other in the first place. Then again, ROSMAP is a special case of a cohort because they exclusively recruited participants from religious orders, which le leads to this cohort being comparably old when we look at participant age. And on the same time, we have predominantly female participants in this study. So we have above 70% females, which cannot be seen in any of the other studies. Even in Etni, we have slightly more males than females actually. So that ROSMAP is pretty far off is also somewhat to be expected, um, which again makes us believe that this log likelihood clustering approach is actually quite a good measure for cohort comparability and similarity. So to summarize my talk, um, I would say that we indeed found evidence for significant difference across prog um, progression patterns mined from different cohorts and that the progression models we have used for mining these cores actually also learn and pick up the biases that are in the cohort data so the models always are somewhat cohort specific and this is especially important when we talk about model validation because if we have such a cohort that has learned the biases of uh, such a model that has learned the biases of a cohort and we apply it to another cohort, this can definitely impede the validation performance and thereby also hinders model generalization. Then again, on the other hand, um, if we try to talk about similarity of cohorts, we found that the likelihood based clustering actually provides quite a good estimate for the comparability of cohorts and goes actually way beyond summary statistics. And this is something that you often see in literature that people just report, OK, our cohorts are somewhat similar because they share similar demographic characteristics or so at baseline. Um, so we um, also for cognitive scores and so on, and we have a certain snapshot in time. And this clustering here actually goes way beyond that because we take progression into account and then we believe that this could also help researchers in finding suitable validation and discovery data set combinations which can be used for machine learning approaches to actually find validation data sets that are in the domain of the model that it learned. So with that, I would like to thank the Compage organizers for giving me the opportunity to present this work here. Um, I also want to thank any data owners that are willing to share data because without them we, we won't be able to do any research like this. And I also want to thank my colleagues at Sky. And finally, this project is funded by the Virtual Brain Cloud project on the Horizon 2020 program. So thank you and I'm happy to receive any questions. <laughs>